Oh, yeah, and yeah. Yo creo que no. Well, let us uh, go on to our next panel. If you, may, if you uh, take your seats, thank you very much uh, for accompanying us. The next panel is um, on, um, it, it actually is perfect because it continues the conversation uh, on uh, the rule of law in Mexico and it will raise some of the concerns that came up in the previous discussion. Let me uh, reintroduce myself. I'm Tony Payan, the director of the Mexico Center here at the Baker Institute. And um, the panel, the conversation today is on the rule of law. There's a lot of questions that we have uh, about the possibility of the energy industry in Mexico truly, truly reforming itself and changing and accommodating the requirements in terms of the rule of law uh, in Mexico. And uh, in that regard, it is uh, uh, quite fortuitous that I, uh, along with uh, Jose Ramon Cosillo, uh, one of the uh, uh, Supreme Court justices in Mexico, and with uh, Steven Zamora, who directs the University of Houston's Center for U.S.-Mexican Law, and uh, myself direct this uh, project on Mexico's uh, rule of law and the energy reform. On March 13th, we had a great workshop in Mexico City in which uh, 20 uh, authors of different white papers presented their results, uh, their preliminary results. And in the fall, we will have um, the publications available for you on various topics of the, uh, the rule of law and energy reform in Mexico. And this panel will try to share some of those reflections with you. In the meantime, let me introduce um, uh, the panel. Uh, first, we have uh, Josefina Cortez Campo, is a professor of the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México, ITAM, and uh, um, uh, she is uh, currently a visiting researcher uh, and scholar uh, at the uh, University of Houston's Center for U.S. and Mexican Law. Welcome, Josefina. We also have um, Anelena Fierro Ferraz, whom I just had the pleasure to meet in Mexico City at that workshop I mentioned to you um, in March, um, on March 13th. She's the dean of the master's uh, program in public policy and professor of the uh, uh, Centro de Investigación y Docencia Económicas, SIDAC. Uh, and then we also have Alberto de la Peña, who's a partner with our sponsor, uh, Haynes Boone. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, each of the panelists to address issues of the rule of law, which is a big concern in Mexico, and it's been a concern for at least eight to ten years now, and it continues to be a concern for all of us. Uh, and uh, each of them will speak for about 10, 12 minutes, uh, and then uh, I will ask uh, some questions uh, a uh, couple of them uh, from the panel, and then I will open it to a conversation, and hopefully we can conclude uh, by about 12.15 in time for uh, uh, to break for lunch. Uh, please, um, Josefina. Uh, yeah, uh, can we have uh, Josefina's uh, uh, presentation, uh, please? Thank you very much. First of all, I really would like to thank to, um, well, thank the Baker Institute for this kind invitation. And of course, thanks to all of you for your time. For this session, I decided to organize my, my, organize my talk in two parts. In the first part, I'm going to present a very short description of the Mexican context. Why? Because as you certainly know, this is the context, this is the scenario where the Mexican reform, reforms have, are being implemented. Second, I'm going to talk about some examples that I named regulatory risk, taking as a reference the hydrocarbons law. And at the very ending, I'm going to present my final remarks. During the last 20 months, 12 structural reforms have been approved by the Mexican con Congress. I found this chart very useful because it allowed me to discuss three main points. The first, I would like to highlight the scope of the reform. 
As you can see there, we are talking about major structural reforms in different fields of regulation. We are talking about fields like energy, education, telecommunication, antitrust. Second point to highlight. As you can see there, a great number of the reforms require constitutional amendments. And finally, the third and the most important uh, point, in my opinion, that we are in the middle of implementation phase of these reforms. In my opinion, the reforms, particularly in paper, and particularly those related to antitrust, telecommunications, and energy, really announce a new vision of the Mexican government. It is a vision that relies on the market as a mechanism to foster the economic growth. By the way, an economy that during the last 30 years was characterized with slow growth, low productivity, and pervasive labor market informality. Having said that, it is important, and let me be clear, really, I really want to present the, information, the reforms in a very positive way. But I think that it is impossible to deny the context that or where those reforms are being implemented. So I think that it is time to present you a little bit and a short profile of the Mexican context. As you know, Mexico is the second largest economy in Latin America. Yes. However, in my opinion, from an institutional or social perspective, we are still a young democracy that works over the basis of a weak institutional framework. Mexico is a country where the words poverty and illiteracy label the public agenda, of course, but most importantly, determine the future of a huge number of Mexicans. In this context, what about the rule of law? And I'm afraid we will not have good news. According to the World Justice Project Rule of Law Index, thank you very much, Anna. It, the index ranks Mexico in the 79th position of 99 in total. I think that the ranks speak for itself. I really think so. But it's interesting to notice this. The index considers different elements, not just one or two, eight elements, like constraints on government powers, absence of corruption, open government, fundamental rights, order and security, regulatory enforcement, civil justice, and criminal justice. Therefore, we really can say that we are in front of a very integral approach. And this is the reason why this work, this index, considers that we have a real rule of law, at least when we have three conditions, and I'm going to summarize that information. First, public, public sorry, and private entities are accountable under the law. Second, the laws fulfill universal requirements, not only in terms of design, also in terms of the protection of human rights. And the third and the most important element, when there is an effective judicial system. We can consider, of course, that this index is a very strict one, and that's the reason why we have a difficult position. <coughs> But however, I really think that beyond the definition, reality always goes further. Let me refer very briefly to three important cases. I just seen up a case, Aristegui case, and the Canadian mine. In the first case, I just seen up, I just to highlight some facts. 42 students disappeared overnight after a long period of investigation. The former attorney general, general just announced that all the students were murdered after being kidnapped by the local police on the orders of the town's mayor. First case. Second case, Aristegui's one. A reporter informed, Aristegui, Carmen Aristegui informed, that a seven million house that the president shared with his family belonged to a businessman linked to a millionaire project, infrastructure project, by the way. Months later, the project was canceled and the reporter was fired. The third and the final case, a Canadian mine. This month, a Canadian mine report a 8.5 million in gold. The, uh, the report was that were stolen 8.5 million in an armed robbery. Of course, this is interesting, but it is most interesting saying this. While the CEO was uh, in the middle of an interview, 
and he was talking about the normal operation of the mind, he said, well, and I'm quoting now, we have a good relationship with the area drug cartel. The cases I refer to certainly illustrate a great number of problem, as, or problems associated with different issues like judicial system, the protection of human rights, rights, the link between legal and illegal, and illegal powers. In short, all the problems are related with the way in which Mexico, Mexico decided to build their institutions and, of course, the rule of law. At this point, you certainly understand these two statements. First. Reforms are general when well designed, but we need to focus on the way they are implemented. Second, we can do 10, 11, 12, 20 reforms. But if we do not add trust, it is impossible to reach the potential of the reforms. So three key words, administrative capacity, trustworthiness, and predictability. Those elements should be essential elements of the political agenda. So far, I've tried to give you a, a little overview of the Mexican reality or context. Now let's talk about the hydrocarbons law. In the first part of my presentation, please notice that I refer to real cases. Now I'm going to talk about normative cases. For this purpose, I select some examples, not related to violence or crime, but related to discretionary powers. Of course, discretionary powers are essential for an administrative activity, but Without limits, of course, they may be illegal. How much time do I have? Oh, you're uh, seven minutes into perfect. 12 minutes, so you're perfect. Perfect, thank you. I'm going to present to you three cases, and if I have time, I'm going to present the fourth one. But the first one. This is a very important case, not only because it is related to this seminar, also because under the Mexican Constitution, the bidding process has a special protection. Why? Because this is a mechanism conceived to guarantee the Mexican state the best conditions in terms of acquisition and assignations of goods and services. That is the reason why, important to notice that please, that the Mexican Supreme Court over the years has analyzed the way in which laws must protect the bidding process. And I'm going to <laughs> remark this, laws, no regulations. What I'm trying to say is to highlight two points. First, according to the Supreme Court, laws must establish the essential elements of the bidding process, not the regulations. Second, it is important to avoid the presence of open clauses. Why? Because, of course, open clauses allow or may allow discrimination and discretionary powers. Taking those general elements into account, into account, sorry, it is important now to consider uh, the hydrocarbons law. In my opinion, the design of the bidding process, according to the hydrocarbons law, is superficial. Why? Because essential elements are or rely on the regulation instead of the law. And in the previous panel, you said we wish to have more time to have the, the play very clear. Okay, that time comes from the law, not from the regulations. The second case um, related to open clauses. If, for example, you analyze or you ask uh, to the hydrocarbons law about the requirements that Pemex must fulfill to get an entitlement, an entitlement, you are going to find that they are open clauses. So if you just go straight to the law, you won't find the total requirements that Pemex must fulfill. Why? Again, those requirements are supposed to be in the regulations. And not only the regulations, a lot of administrative criteria come here. And of course, there's some other examples, but let me just highlight the second one. If you are asking about the parties excluded, excluded in a bidding process, of course, you are going to find an open clauses again. Second, very briefly, in the field of social, social impact. For this example, it is important to say that according to the Mexican Constitution, the oil and gas industry is considered as a strategic area that works over the basis of public interest. Because of that, the Mexican state preserves an important set of regulatory powers. And here's an example, the social impact. According to the new legal framework, before the bidding process takes place, 
it is mandatory to evaluate the social impact of each project. In relation to that, the hydrocarbon laws establishes, I, I'm sorry because I know that this is a big, big paragraph, but I decide to highlight in red the problematic part. Pay attention on that. The state will set the amounts or the rules which the contractor or assignation holder should provide for the humane and sustainable development in areas of health, education, labor, and of course, others. Is there any kind of economic <coughs> limit, limit there or not? I'm afraid laws, at least hydrocarbons laws, don't say or doesn't say anything about that. Of course, we are in the presence of a big umbrella that in absence of legal parameters and as a result of discretionary powers, it is a typical case of uncertainty. And I just put in a very nice way the word regulatory risks. Third case, related to sanctions. <coughs> According to the hydrocarbons law, there, there are different, different cases. Uh, it's a huge list. I just pick uh, two up, and that's it. The lack of compliance with the terms and conditions with are, which are established in the assignation. Second, violations of the law and its regulatory provisions. Those are the cases that may allow sanctions. What happened here? In a very interesting way, the regulation said this. Well, not say it, I mean <coughs> said that the regulation eliminates the sanctions completely eliminate the sanctions under two conditions, spontaneous compliance and confession. In my opinion, even though that, that this case may be considered as a case of incentive-based regulation, from a legal and constitutional perspective, we have a problem of normative hierarchy in here. Absolutely, I'm absolutely uh, sure about that. And we cannot forget that this industry, the oil and gas industry, operates over the basis of public interest. Finally, this is a case that you already mentioned in the last uh, panel, but it's interesting to notice, and I used to explain this case saying this, if things can be easy, let's complicate them. Instead of having one type of dispute resolution, we have three. And maybe you can think that it is a very big, big, big umbrella that can cover and predict all the cases that you are going to have. Of course not. Let me, uh, let me ask you, for example, what about the mechanism of resolution in terms, in terms of entitlements? Because the laws talk about contracts, but what about entitlements? Is there any kind of problem or we don't have a problem? Second problem, talking about the bidding process. According to the laws, the only way to solve a dispute here is the Amparo Indirecto. But the law says final resolution. Yes, and there's a lot of inter intermediary or internal decision inside the process. What about those kind, of, those kind of decisions? There's no answer in the law. Just a final idea about the cases. What the four, four cases have in common is a complex or unfinished normative design. The situation opens the door to potential disputes. Maybe, not now because we are at the very beginning of this regulatory adventure. Now we, maybe, we don't have a problem, but later I'm sure it will. Now it is time to conclude. Just three final remarks. First, in my opinion, it is impossible to present or analyze the Mexican structural reforms in an isolated or dissociated way. Those who have presented and understood the reform just from the perspective of productivity or economic growth should not forget that operating those reforms in a complex scenario like the Mexican one will definitely come with challenges. Second, the Mexican democracy is in a process of consolidation, right? And it is possible to recognize the steps forward we have taken. However, there is a long way we need to go in terms of the rule of law and social stability. Finally, and this is a question even for me, we are used to thinking about the rule of law uh, in a way in which it can guarantee the positive implementation of the reforms in a sort of one-way direct relationship. 
But I think that it is important to think as well about the ways in which structural reforms can stimulate positive changes in the process of consolidation the rule of law. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sofina. <laughs> well, we'll go straight to the, uh, to the remarks uh, uh, by Ana Elena Fierro. Welcome, and thank you, Ana Elena. Well, it just comes right to what Josefina has been, has been saying. As you know, I'm not an expert on energy. What I, my line of research is transparency, accountability, and what's responsibility. Let me just start by saying what my presentation is based on an analysis of what the law says right now. It's a complex set of laws that I would like to show you. Uh, but it's still in, as the commissioner said early this morning, the, the real challenge is how we are going to implement these laws. And the first thing I want to say is this. Um, we usually do not have clear what's the difference between our systems of transparency, what do we understand as accountability, and when we should uh, make some public servants responsible for negligence, like we were talking for a little while ago. So this is the first challenge. In order for really to have a rule of law, we would have to know when the state is um, accountable for what they're doing, what is information they should be giving us on this sector, and when can the public servants be responsible for their for what they do and it's still not very clear in the law <laughs> thank you okay so first what I want to say that something that um, Josefina has already said is that we have a complex set of constitutional rules we have the next Okay, this is only to show you what you need to read if you want to know what are the um, government um, obligations on transparency, accountability, and responsibility. You have what the Constitution says, not only in the articles, but in these transitional articles, which are longer and more complex than the main articles. Then you have the general transparency law, which is just enacted. And then you have in all these laws a separate chapter for responsibility, a separate chapter for accountability, and then sanctioning if, if it's the case. Next one, please. What are our main challenges? Let's say I put weaknesses here, but I would, I would like to address them as challenges in their implementation. For transparency, well, the, the laws were very worried about doing this enormous checklist of things the state has to put on the website. But um, unfortunately, it is not very clear who's in charge. For example, contracts. Everybody's worried about contracts. And the uh, commission has responsibility on publicizing contracts. Uh, Fondo Petrolero has uh, some responsibility in that. Pemex has responsibility in that. So when you have all these people that are supposed to publicize the contracts, then it gets all messed up, really. So, and the other one, it is unclear what are the um, discretionary powers of some of these authorities for classifying information. And this is going to be quite an issue. There's a lack of requests, for example, for clear language, which is something that under transparency, good practices is a common use. And there's also no regulation about open data, which that is, has, has to be in, in which formats. And this, believe me, it makes a difference. It's not the same if you have a database that could show you what's been the prices in certain um, areas of contracting, that what you, if you have to just read contracts on PDF, and you just will have to read the copies of these contracts. This makes a huge difference on transparency. No? And then, of course, the enormous proliferations of websites that you will have to consult if you really want to have a clear, uh, let's say, a clear panorama of, of any of these things. Thank you. Um, what about accountability? Well, in accountability, I would say that our weaknesses is, I find the controls, and it's still on only what the law says, we have a lot of reports. Authorities are comply to creating a bunch of, in, of reports or, and to inform, for example, La Hacienda, or, I mean, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Energy. But there's not clear what's going to happen with that report. What does that report going to say and what consequences this is going to have? 
there are a lot of internal and external audits, but from what we have right now, these audits will go to the CEOs of Pemex or of Energy. So we don't still have the outside accountability. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are no clear sanctions, as was um, Josefina telling. No? Uh, supposedly, uh, the congressional oversight is very weak. Why do I say this? Because most of these areas will inform uh, Congress through uh, the Secret uh, Ministry of uh, Finance. No, there's not going to be a separate report. And second, in any of these laws or the constitutional reform, there is a mention on what uh, it's Auditoria Superior de la Federación, which is our General Accounting Office at the Federal Congress. There is no more support for the General Accounting Office for having, for example, more resources enabled to really analyze what the results of these uh, energy of, of our energy industries uh, profits and there of course there's no know-how on how to do this in a specific way thank you Jose. Okay. how about responsibility of our public servants well here I have to say there are some uh, important strengths and these which are very I mean the, we don't have this in any other laws and that's the obligation of creating, and I'm sorry for the typo there, I mean, it's when you write in three languages at the same time, sometimes horrible, is the ethics code, no? So <laughs> one is that, the ethics code, it's, 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 they are comply of creating ethics codes in Pemex, in, um, in, uh, in the commission actually, and in CFE. Then the whistleblower protection. For me, this is a real innovation. There were, there's no other law in Mexico that grants protection to whistleblowing. And um, international practice has shown that the real way to fight corruption is by whistleblowing. And you have important cases on that. No? And of course, the publication of conflict of interests also. This is also a new, and I, and I find it to be an important part of this. What's the weakness? My main concern here is that the, um, the laws of Pemex and CFE have a provision that says that the uh, administrative board of directors are not liable as public servants. But the administrative board of directors is composed by nine members. Five of them are our secretary of energy, our secretary of finance, our secretary of economy, and a secretary of environment. When I ask why, they say, oh, but now Pemex is going to be a private entity. He will then he will have to respond like private entities. Yes, but Pemex has 110 million shareholders. Please, I mean, you are an expert on this. Do you really think, think 110 million stakeholders can make their board of administrator accountable? Mainly, this is my, my remark. The next one, this is only some uh, challenges. What challenges do we have? Well, I guess in transparency, what we need is a pro pro proactive transparency policy in the energy sector. What should we aim at? I think we should aim at complying with destructive industry transparency initiative. This is something that Mexico has been working on. And especially, uh, I guess that the part that's more important on this part is the one on open government. It means not only what information should be up on the website, but the quality of the information that's on the website. No? The second one, we need a general accounting office reloaded. I mean, if we really want our um, public entities to be accountable on the energy sector, we need to have um, serious uh, auditing from our congressional uh, controllers, and that means giving them the know-how, giving them more resources than one they already have. And something that I think we are already undergoing, it's an anti-corruption system. We have, uh, the Senate's already passed a, a constitutional reform to strengthen our anti-corruption system in the two ways. I mean, in analyzing the processes inside the, um, the different ministers or the different agencies on, um, for, to lower discretionary powers that are always a window for corruption. And then we are, um, we are also under the review, or hopefully we will be under review, of most of our responsibility laws for, in order for them to really become um, 
uh, applicable because what, what happens today is our um, uh, the way to sanction public servants before it was a political way. We would have to say our Title IV of the Constitution was there, but it was almost never applied. You didn't need to apply it. There are other, you know, not legal sanctions, but political sanctions. This is changing. And I think one uh, very good news about that is the acceptance of this anti corruption system a packet of reforms uh, by most of the parties. And then hopefully this will go on, on for um, local approval for the constitutional reform. So this will be like my first reflections. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, thank you, Tony. Thank you, uh, panelists. Well, I think the rule of law is a fascinating subject, particularly when you deal with Mexico. And I would like just to make a general comment and then go into a little some specifics based on what I have seen. You know, having advice in companies, you know, for 20 years doing business in Mexico. In the general context, you know, the rule of law is critical not only for the energy reform, but it's critical for the uh, for Mexico as a country. And, uh, you know, everything is relative, you know, and if you compare the rule of law of uh, Mexico with other less developed countries, whether in Latin America or Africa, Mexico is doing relatively well. If you compare the rule of law of Mexico with North America, then I think is where you can see, you know, uh, big challenges. And I personally, you know, we have talked about the North American uh, 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 energy market. I think Mexico should always look up you know, and, 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 and not compare itself with, you know, other less developed markets, but, you know, with fully developed markets. Um, in that vein, uh, you know, Mexico, we need to acknowledge something. Mexico has come a long way. I mean, in the last 30 years, Mexico transitioned from being a rural society to an urban society, from a closed economy controlled by the states to an open market economy, and from a semi-authoritarian system controlled by one party to a full democracy. Now, in that transition, Mexico has had a hard time to create strong institutions. And institutions are the, are the ground and the basis of democracies. A democracy with weak institutions is, in a way, a weak democracy. You know, when you have a centralized system where one person, one president decides everything, you don't need, really need strong institutions. And as a matter of fact, you know, an effective president can do a lot of things because, you know, has a centralized power. Doesn't happen with democracies. So Mexico is in this democracy with, uh, you know, with some few exceptions, you know, not that strong, strong institutions. And, and that's, that's is, is directly related to the rule of law, in my opinion. Uh, strong institutions are created when you have the adequate funding, when you have the ad adequate expertise, and particularly when the institutions are removed from the political arena, when the institutions, you know, decide based on the law and apply the law equal to everybody. Um, you know, the, 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 the play of these institutions, you know, obviously has also a saying on the competitiveness of the country as a whole. If you see the, uh, the uh, World Economic Forum report of last year, uh, Mexico dropped six places, now is uh, ranked 61 out of 144 countries in competitiveness. And one of the worst uh, scores that Mexico got was in institutions. In institutions, Mexico was placed 102 out of 144. And if you look within institutions, you know, uh, you know one, one segment is organized crime. Mexico is 140 out of 144 countries. So we are just ahead of four countries. So the key, in my opinion, is uh, for the rule of law in Mexico is to strengthen the institutions uh, uh, as part of our democracy. Now, in terms of more specific comments with the energy reform, I, I, I believe that you know, one of the biggest challenges for the success of the energy reform may even lie outside of the energy reform. The energy reform you know, amended a ton of laws. You know, we have 20 sets, 21 sets of either new laws or amended laws uh, that have a lot of you know, uh, regulations that obviously are, can be more perfect and can be changed and can be improved. But you know, they already, there is some framework for the energy reform in those, in, those, uh, in, those, uh, in those regulations, including accountability, including transparency. You know, we discussed in the morning the, you know, the transparency of the CNH, the, 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 uh, the round uh, one, which it has been uh, outstanding. I mean, sometimes you know, even we check with our clients you know, whether they are, if we 
we go to the CNH webpage and see, you know, if they are qualified or not. I mean, I think the transparency has been uh, uh, managed very well. Um, I think the challenge resides outside because the energy reform at the end of the day is embedded in the legal system, in, the, in what we already have that, you know, uh, I think can be improved. One of the specific challenges is the judiciary, you know, the judicial the system in Mexico. I think the, uh, the, the administration of justice in Mexico needs to be more transparent, needs to be uh, uh, more specialized, needs to be uh, less formalistic. You know, we need uh, uh, more accountability on the, on, on the judiciary too. And, um, you know, one example, for, uh, just to give an idea, you know, if you're in a legal process in Mexico and you want to find a publicly available precedent about, you know, how the court construes a specific uh, provision of a statute, you know, you, maybe you don't find anything because, you know, that information is not really available. And a lot of the discussions many times even with practitioners become kind of an academic discussions because there is not that background of how a, a court... Uh, of law resolve a particular issue. So I think that, 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 that's something that lays ahead, uh, that it, it is going to be very important. Obviously, you know, the Mexican legal system is very formalistic, and that's another issue that, you know, probably will require more kind of a greater reform, where, you know, many times form is as important as substance. And, you know, very formalistic procedures, you know, make transactions more uh, uh, costly because you need to comply with certain, with, with a lot of requirements, you know, create additional delays, and unintendedly, you know, may be a, a fostering uh, corruption. Um, because, you know, when you have a process that has, is too burdensome and has a lot of requirements, you know, there is always someone who wants to take the shortcut. Um, in particular, I think all these issues, you know, nail down to, for example, dispute resolutions in the, uh, in the agreements. You know, we have the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, production chain agreements. You know, we, 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 we know they are subject to international arbitration, the UNCITRAL rules. Um, but two caveats. One is that, you know, you have the administrative rescission that uh, has been discussed during these uh, during these uh, uh, presentations where, you know, the government can terminate uh, uh, the agreement in certain circumstances. For example, if there is a major accident with fatalities uh, uh, caused by negligence of the operator. Uh, you know, if, if, the, uh, oper if the contractor doesn't pay the government, or for example, if for more than one time the contractor delivers incomplete or false information to the authorities. And this is, this is an issue that is in the law, in the hydrocarbons law. It is, I mean, the contract just kind of reflects that. And as a matter of fact, you know, the contract kind of uh, creates now a process of kind of cure period and, you know, kind of tries to reduce that impact. But, you know, the termination of that agreement will be subject to Mexican courts and not to the arbitration of the whole, uh, of the whole agreement. So that's kind of, you know, one impact. The other impact is even though you have, a, you may have an arbitration award or not any matter of any contract, at the end of the day, you know, you will enforce that in Mexico. And that's where, you know, the judicial system, you know, it got to work in the sense that, you know, you don't have, based on a technicality, on a formal issue, you know, to uh, uh, someone challenging the validity of, the, uh, of, 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 of an award, of an, a resolution. And obviously that can go both ways. I mean, that, that can affect either the, the CNH on one side or the contract on the other, on the other side. And, you know, this is also important for the joint ventures and the, you know, associations that uh, companies do to participate in the process because, you know, all those commercial agreements will be subject, you know, in many cases uh, to Mexican law or, you know, even if they are subject to arbitration, they will have to be uh, in, in many cases uh, enforced in Mexico. So, uh, and finally, well, the anti-corruption issue that we have discussed, but that's kind of... You know, in my, in my view, I think one of the biggest challenges uh, ironically resides outside of the energy reform and not necessarily in the, in the set of regulations. No. Thank you, Alberto. I, uh, I have a couple of questions before we open it to the panel. This is obviously a very difficult, uh, complicated um, to topic, the rule of law. 
Uh, but the first one uh, for Alberto de la Peña. Uh, in 2008, under the Calderon administration, uh, the Mexican system was reformed and it was supposed to transit over the next eight years. 2016, within the next year, that term will expire. And the Mexican government is supposed to have transited from a, a Napoleonic Roman European style legal judicial system to a uh, more uh, Anglo-Saxon style open court uh, oral trials type of uh, system. Uh, where is that process and uh, is the Mexican judicial system ready to receive any of these potential controversies or cases that may show up as the field of energy reform gets populated by many more actors uh, that may at any one point enter into conflict with each other. Uh, is the system ready? Uh, how far are we uh, in the implementation of that reform? Uh, will it be ready uh, by 2016? Well, I think the reform that, uh, Tony, that you're referring to uh, different from the energy reform. The energy reform was kind of an overhaul, you know, very expansive, ambitious reform of one sector. In the administration of justice in Mexico, we have been making tweaks here and there. Uh, and that reform was no exception, in my opinion. You know, they, it introduced oral uh, 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 trials for criminal cases, certain criminal cases, and also for some commercial cases which are up to certain value. But really, the mainstream of commercial activity, business litigation in Mexico, kind of remains pretty much the same. Uh, uh, I think the the um, the. Uh, you know, when I go to the States, I have been living here 15 years, and when I go to the States as a, as a Mexican attorney, uh, you know, I say, you know, this Anglo system is kind of weird because I don't understand what's the rule. There are all these cases, and, and I, I saw it as a, as, a, as a disadvantage. Then, you know, when I kind of, you know, start practicing uh, 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 U.S. law, you know, kind of learned that that was a real advantage because you have a lot of case law that you can refer to. And you see how the legal profession, not only in Mexico, but in many places, have, has evolved where, you know, you have civil trained attorneys, civil law trained attorneys, that are more and more trying to get this kind of Anglo background, you know, try what's the case, where, when a, a, a court resolves something like this. Uh, but even though we're in that transition, I think the, um, the bottom line is that our litigation system, particularly for big transactions, for you know, is not quite different from from what it was 10 years ago, or 20 years ago. I mean, it has improved in certain areas, but you know, there there has not been this, uh, uh, I will say, profound reform that is required. So that's why you know you you jump to alternative dispute resolution procedures. But even in that case. You know, you will always be attracted to the legal system because you want to enforce the resolution. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the legal system is the ground of that. And, you know, even the, the public cases that are available, sometimes they don't have the facts. It's just like a very short summary of the law. So it, it's easy to get it out of context. So, you know, this requires, this is a, not a short-term project. But it's a, a critical project, not only for the reform, but for the uh, for kind of the, the the whole country itself. That's kind of my take. Thank you. Uh, anybody else wants to add to this question before I go to the next? Well, uh, just one more thing. All the uh, energy reform goes, goes under the federal jurisdiction, which is sort of an advantage because these are some of our best judges. This I have to say, no? But they are also quite conservative. I mean, they are actually educated on a very formalistic way of, of looking at the law. But what I'd really worries me about this, and we were talking this the, uh, the other day, is that unfortunately the incentives that have been placed for public servants is to not go into IDR resolutions. Many servants get punished for going on the IDR resolutions and to um, take every case all the way to Amparo, even if they know they lose. Okay. This is because we have this crisis in confidence. We all believe that everybody's out there for grabs. So this is something that we have to change. Our public servants, in this case, I think, should have discretion in order to decide what is better for the case, to go into an IDR system or to, or to take it to courts, and to know when to cut their losses. But this is something that, unfortunately, they, they don't have right now. 
Just one quick thing, you know, in, in one of the things that we have seen is, you know, particularly in commercial transactions, you know, you have, these are driven by corporate America in many cases, so you have very complex, you know, transaction terms. So when those are litigated, you know, in a Mexican court, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the judge, you know, kind of has a hard time to understand even the business kind of conceptual, the, the deal. The deals are nowadays very complex, right? You have all sorts of sort of provisions that, you know, even for practitioners are challenging. So when they get to a judge that, you know, this is too far from, 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 from his or her reality, I think it's a challenge. Uh, a question uh, for Ana Elena. Ana Elena, uh, Pemex will remain in some ways a state enterprise and it, uh, and it will be treated differently, I suppose, and it's a question than, rather than a statement than other energy companies. Uh, in fact, uh, privileges have been carved out from, for Pemex from the very beginning. Round zero is in many ways a privileged uh, round exclusively for Pemex. But at the same time, Pemex has undergone a certain transition uh, to something that they no longer label a state agency, but a state productive enterprise, whatever the definition may be. In the regulatory system, in the way that Pemex is treated, and in the way that Pemex is conceived in this kind of hybrid position, will, do you think that the government regulatory agencies and that the entire judicial system, and of course the political system, will subject Pemex to the same standards and rules and regulations and enforce them on Pemex in the same way that they would any other foreign company, or will Pemex continue to have a privileged position carved out for itself in the Mexican system? Well, from what you read on the law, it seems that they will try to treat it, um, Pemex as any other company. No? That's why the uh, board of directors are, will be treated as by private persons and not as public servants. But the thing that you cannot take your eyes off is that it's a public entity. And that many of what we are going to ask of Pemex is different. It's the most like the example I was uh, saying. You know that the board of directors in any company will have to be accountable to their shareholders, right? So if anything goes wrong, you have the shareholders there. But Pemex has 110 million shareholders because they say that they are, um, uh, it's still the nation's property. How are we going to do that? That, our, our colleague economics call it, the strategy of the commons is no one's land. So this is something that we have to be very careful about. In that sense, I would say that it would be, I would rather have Pemex be accountable as a public entity and not as a private entity. You know, this this is something I know that in the market he has to compete as any other agent in the market. But the truth is that the persons that take decisions on that they are not thinking as uh, the board of directors of other companies. They have you know to think on other basis because they are a public entity. Um, I have a. Yes, please, by all means. A anybody that wants to say follow up on this question, please go ahead. Yeah, I would like to to present this case in a very easy, easy way. I am going to try hard, but I think that the question is, what are you talking about privilege, or in other words, what a privilege is? And let me give you a little bit of information. I'm trying to preserve confidential information. <laughs> but I was quite near of the round zero, zero quite near. And one of the first question was, which is the procedure? I mean, under which parameter the state is going to decide? I'm not talking about in favor of Pemex or against Pemex, no. I'm talking about just let me know the procedure. There's no procedure. I mean, for those who consider that Article 6 in the transitional articles was the procedure, of course, it is impossible to say that because so we are talking about a privilege, or we are talking about a sort of narrative against the public entity. And I think that this is a risk. So you are asking about a sort of prediction, what is going to happen. I prefer to think about the laws and what the laws establishes right now. And what, and what we really can find now, it is like a diff difficult 
place, place difficult field to, to understand in terms of balance and in terms of discrimination. Now we have a very liberal approach, but maybe later we are in the middle of elections, we are going to change the government. What are we going to talk about and we, what kind of the, uh, narrative we are going to select? Thank you. I, I mean, just a point there. I mean, I think there should be a balance because, you know, uh, um, obviously there got to be accountability, you know, for board members and uh, as any other company. But on the other side of the coin, you know, you're going to have Pemex competing with private companies who move, you know, on a commercial terms. And, and, and you don't want to have also the management of that uh, a government-owned company be so tied by strong, strict regulations that sometimes they want to do something that is positive, but because of the fear that we have discussed about these regulations, they they feel they got to go around it or you are tied to, you know. So I think that, and it's going to be a challenge and probably, you know, goes to one of the panels that they discuss about, uh, you know, this upcoming regulation about Pemex that, you know, this has to be addressed in more detail. Thank you. I have another uh, question, uh, and I'll address it to Annalena, and then uh, one more question to Josefina after that. And uh, uh, the local federal divide. Uh, one of uh, one of the components of the project that I on the rule of law that I mentioned earlier was uh, the uh, has to do with the conversations we've had with different officials from Coahuila and Nuevo León and Tamaulipas and Veracruz and Hidalgo and Campeche and different um, uh, local government officials. Most of Mexico's corruption, in spite of uh, the enormous evidence of federal level corruption, is really local. It's governors embezzling funds, it's mayors asking for bribes, it's local officials participating in organized crime. And I think that creating a federal framework shields, perhaps, the industry from these uh, low level officials um, that are. Uh, 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 in some ways quite corrupt, do they? Does the federal um, framework shield companies from eventually having to deal with local government officials uh, in whose hands are the permitting processes, the local public uh, safety issues, the police, they're, especially the governors, if the Policia Unica or the United Unified Command, uh, will the governors, I mean, they're, they're going to have a lot of power, not the power to regulate, but the power to obstruct uh, and the power to extract concessions. Uh, can the federal government deal with that? Is there a framework, anti-corruption framework, that will deal effectively with the local governments once the companies deploy into these different fields? And obviously I'm referring to the onshore uh, projects. Yes, I, let me um, say this. The first to oppose to the anti-corruption system were the governors because one of the provisions says that when you receive federal money, then it's going to have to be um, accounted by uh, the Auditoria Superior de la Federación, the federal GAO. And the first ones who, who said uh, we don't like that, that it's against federalism, were gover governors. So, yeah, I mean, your, your infrastructure is going to be in a certain state, even, and you're going to need uh, some safety about that. Many of the permits, the like construction permits, they are given on the local level, not even on the state level, it's on the municipal level. So it will be false to say that you don't have to deal with these authorities. You will have, even Pemex has a hard time dealing with these authorities. No, uh, Before you have this, um, they'll tell you these stories about um, being able to control by local leaders where, for example, a, a uh, some infrastructure was going to be built and then being able to control that because you had one party, so it wasn't that difficult, no? But now, this is one of the cost of democracies. Now you have a bunch of leaders, so either it becomes more expensive to bribe all the leaders, no? Or you just have to deal with that, with that other part. So I think even though most of the, uh, most of the energy sector will be regulated in the federal level, you cannot uh, oversight the fact that you're going to be building things in certain places, and this has a lot to do with local law. Uh, I have a question uh, for Josefina. You, you used the words unfinished design. Uh, can you clarify a little bit more in the, in the regulatory architecture and the new uh, uh, 
uh, energy sector or architecture, the design of the institutions, what is unfinished, and can you come up with two or three very specific, uh, well-identified changes uh, to move in the direction of completing this design? Yes. Three? <laughs> um, <laughs> I just got two, but okay. Two. That's good. Good enough. I think that, I think to clarify something first. When I decide to select the examples, uh, I've just considered my previous experience working as a director of bidding processes in the antitrust uh, regulator uh, in Mexico. And of course, it was very easy, really very easy, to ask three questions. What about sanctions? What about the bidding process? What about the disputes resolutions? And I just go straight to the point. So it's a matter of experience, what I'm talking about. But I really think that law seems to be a little hurried. It's like, go, 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 go. And next, the regulations. And next, the bidding process. And next, of course, we're talking about a model that it is impossible to finish in one, two, three months. No? So it's a general diagnostic of the, all these reforms. That's the reason why I decided to show you the OCD chart. Because just like 12 reforms, can you imagine that? So it is impossible. It's a, an intuitive thing that it is impossible to have very well designed uh, laws. Two parameters. I am not talking, about, talking just about normative design in terms of clarity, transparency, stability. I am talking about uh, human rights protection. And that's why I select the, the fields of sanctions and process. Two examples. I mean, I think that we have the same examples that I presented before, uh, sanctions and bidding process. The bad thing is that I think that laws already made a decision. Laws now are filled with holes. No? It's like if you ask for, for example, sanctions to Pemex, OK, there, now you are going to find that the regulation said, oh, we can eliminate the sanctions. Are we going to, to, to prepare a new process of reforms? Now I think that the question is that we really need to teach authorities and to teach the operators how to deal with this scenario. Because, of course, it's a very challenging one. Thank you. We have uh, about five minutes for a few questions, if there are any. Please come on up to the microphone over here. And there's another microphone over here to my left. Uh, and uh, please uh, shoot. Hi. Uh, I think so. Well, uh, it, uh, there's a little button up on top. Just pull, pull it up towards you. There you go. Sure. Well, many Mexicans feel democracy has fallen short of what was expected and still are longing for the old, good old days, in quotes, of one party, one central president that decided everything, made the decisions, everything was carried out. And right now it feels like it's anarchy between the parties. No one is taking accountability. So do you see that, all, that the energy reform could fall in the same trap as democracy is right, right now with Mexico, whereas you will have and then the reform that every Mexican is expecting jobs to be created, probably more than will be created at the beginning. Many, I have heard many Mexicans say, oh, now we're going to have jobs, now we're going to have prosperity, now we're going to have all this in the short term. Where that really is not the way the industry operates, it will take time, and it will take wh what you have said, all the difficulty to pass all those difficulties that will have to be faced. And at some point could be challenged by the Mexicans saying, hey, is this what we wanted? This is just looks like democracy. We have it, and there's really no benefit from it. We might be better off having, again, our big Pemex doing everything for us. Thank you. Uh, anybody, you want to address that? Um, I mean, I think that, that, that that's, a, that's a very good question. It's kind of very broad in the sense that, you know, it goes to many variables. I think the, uh, the, what's going to be the outcome of the uh, energy reform, we don't know because we don't have a crystal ball. But I think there is a good expectation that it will create more, uh, will, will help the economy, will create more jobs. 
uh, security uh, for Mexicans. I mean, I think it will boost the economy, no doubt. It's going to take time. It's not something that is going to happen when, you know, next year. Uh, but it's, you know, in the medium, long term, I think it's going to be really good for the country. I think the, uh, the, uh, the democracy has its own price. And, uh, you know, the price is that this is a slow process. And the, the fact that uh, the president probably won't be able to change a lot of things one day to another, it's a good thing. Because that means that the institutions are start working. The day that Mexico sees that now the president is deciding everything and, and you know is taking all the decisions and shifting the, the 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 country from one direction to another, I think we should be concerned at that point because that will mean that the the, the institutions in the democracy are not really working well. Let me tell you something that I tell my students, and it's like Mexican democracy is like a teenager. They love the rights, you know, of democracy. We love to have a lot of opinions. We uh, claim a lot of rights. But when it comes to the obligation of being a citizen of that democracy, uh, then we don't like, you know, we don't like to pay for gas if the car is lent to us. So this is something that we as Mexicans have to learn. When in these interviews, when the unfortunate case of Ayotzinapa, people will go and tell me, it was the state, right? And I said, yes, but the definition of state is government and their population. So if you ask me what really excites me about the energy reform in this sense is that if we really can make this market a competitive market, I think in, in the real sense, not like our telecommunication market, for example. No? then I think this is going to be an example for the rest of the way we manage things in the country, for the rest of the way we, we treat economic agents in Mexico. And that's what makes it, uh, you know, like this challenge in the sense of the rule of law in general. Very briefly. Um, first, I present the cases, then the normative cases, and now let's go to the stories. But it's a very brief one. Talking about my concerns uh, related to the corruption and crime and violence, one amazing lawyer, a very well-known lawyer, uh, answered uh, to my question this. Josefina, don't worry. This industry knows how to work in these kind of scenarios, referring to corruption, crime. And all the after the evening that day, I was like, oh my God. So yes, before, during, after, there's a business. So that's the answer that I've received. Is there a business? That is the only thing that imports, or that it is important, sorry. And that's why the last remark was this. Of course, we can think about the rule of law as a real possibility to improve these kind of reforms. But I'm trying to think in an opposite way. In which ways these kind of reforms can build a better democracy for Mexico, a better rule of law for Mexico? And I am afraid to say that, but part of the responsibility is located in the private companies. In many cases, the corruption just starts right there because there is a case. So that's why I'm say, I am saying that it is important to be aware of the situation. I think we have uh, one minute, George. Uh, so please, uh, real quick, and then we will conclude. Yeah. I think this is a great panel, great panel to give some pushback to, you know, reality. And um, yesterday we issued a report called Ideological Aspects of Round One, <laughs> which I'll be glad to send to the panel. But the question, the concept that in this report and in my own thinking is that it's not only what you all have said, there's something behind that, and that is what we might call the national oil narrative of Mexico. And so, as I'm seeing it, the law was designed and the regulations were designed and the institutions were designed to accommodar, meaning to fit nicely with the national oil narrative more than to fit nicely with international expectations. So if you would comment to Thank that. Thank you. Anybody has a comment on that? <laughs> I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you. I mean, being academic and 
it is impossible to deny that it is like a narrative there, like a narrative of successful public policies. Last week, I just heard that security is not a problem. We already have the business and we already have the companies and we are very happy to receive you. Correct, but what about the Mexican context? What about the reality itself? We are talking about, I mean, we are in the very beginning of this adventure, but I would like to think in a long-term public policies and I would like just to put an example. What about if we change our government, not from a liberal one, a radical one? Does this loss is going to help, to help you? Really, I don't think so, because are superficial in certain cases, like bidding processes or like sanctions. I think we're running out of quarters for that microphone, but uh, uh, but I really appreciate that. I, I'm going to uh, ask for your patience for about two more minutes. I'm going to invite, uh, uh, I think, an observation uh, from Ariel, who's also a very good expert on this, and then I'm going to ask uh, Ricardo Garcia to come up already to the podium uh, to make a final remarks uh, for about a minute, a minute and a half, and then I will thank everybody that needs to be thanked, and we're done. Please, go ahead. Well, uh, congratulations first to the panel and you know, great topic. So uh, one question and uh, one possible alternative to address a lot of the, you know, some of the issues that you have discussed, international cooperation. Um, many of the, dis of the issues that have been discussed sounds to me, it's like a, what I've heard 20 years ago when NAFTA actually entered into effect, you know, would we able, are going to be able to actually keep up with the, you know, how do we control a number of things? And Mexico is, is starting to learn and needs to learn that this is an international market, international players, and, and there are international standards to address all these issues. And companies coming, you were talking about private companies. So we need to, I believe, change this view of the evil commerce to Mexico taking our, 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 our uh, uh, treasures, national treasures. That, that's not really the case. And I believe from what I've seen uh, practicing for um, on, on the energy practice for 20 years plus, and what I've seen in the last several years, they are more concerned about potential sanctions, uh, you know, for FCPA kind of activities here in the U.S. or anti-bribery acts in, in, in the U.K. Many of these companies have activities here in the U.S. or worldwide, so they don't want to do something in Mexico that actually would trigger this kind of this kind of of, of liability. So, how do we, so the concrete question is how can we actually achieve this kind of cooperation between the Mexican government they, and, and, and other, and other uh, partners, commercial partners, to actually, instead of trying to invent the wheel, instead of having to learn how really the, the whole industry works, just uh, try to, to bring uh, the best practices that we have uh, abroad and at the same time keep up and inform and have this dialogue, constant dialogue and inform uh, our peers in, in you know in, in the U.S. and another another markets with respect to anti-corruption type of facts. That is an excellent observation, and all I can tell you is somebody ought to send the Mexican federal government a memo that they're not in Toluca, they're in the st in the in the capital of the state, and that the spotlight and the stage is not a state or a province; it's really international, and that I think will make them. Quick learners, please. Thank you, Tony. My name is Ricardo Garcia Moreno. I'm a corporate partner at Haynes & Boone here in Houston. Uh, I wanted to be, thank everybody on behalf of Haynes & Boone for participating in today's discussion. Uh, in particular, to thank our keynote speaker, Juan Carlos Cepeda. And This, this reform for Mexico is critical. In a decade, Pemex's production had dropped nearly a third, from producing 3.5 million barrels uh, a day in 2004 to 2.6 million barrels in 2013. Pemex did not have the resources, both financial, technical, and otherwise, to take advantage of Mexico's natural resources, especially since many of its revenues were destined for the Mexican treasury. Even so, Mexico remains one of the top 10 producers in the world. Moreover, these reforms were needed uh, to keep the engine of Mexico's economy, its manufacturing sector, 
uh, uh, vibrant, otherwise it would be severely hampered as that sector needs reliable and cost-effective power supply. I believe these reforms, along with a lot of people here, present a tremendous opportunity, not just for foreign investors, not just for Texas companies, but for the Mexican people and the country itself. There's no question that these reforms have the ability to dwarf the economic growth created by NASA, <coughs> for example. These reforms will create jobs. They will create wealth. They will create educational opportunities. And at the end of the day, that is great for the citizenry, citizens of Mexico. It would be great for the combat against the drug cartels and other abuses of power and give really the children of Mexico an opportunity um, in, in, in the country. Uh, the hope is that these reforms will promote social responsibility at many levels, including protection for workers, the environment, conservation of natural resources, and many other items. However, these reforms cannot occur overnight, and they have not occurred overnight. We need to keep in mind that Mexico is trying to accomplish in a very short window is really unprecedented. They're creating new laws and regulations, corruption laws, environmental laws. They're putting out international tenders and doing everything that, that is needed for that, from creating data routes, putting together information, presenting it to the public, creating contracts. Uh, they're creating new governmental institutions to oversee the change and create a system of checks and balances. Uh, they have to staff them with the appropriate people. They have to restructure huge bureaucracies, FEMEX and CFE, and turn those into productive enterprises. This is a monumental effort, and we all need to recognize this. There's no question that there will be challenges along the way. We've heard several of them today. Corruption and fair competition. We've talked about, Juan Carlos has talked about transparency and accountability and the steps that Mexico, Mexico and CNH is taking to create and go beyond standards internationally uh, to create transparency and accountability. Uh, we've also heard flexibility. The Mexican government wants to hear from private industry, from participants, from its citizens on ways to better carry out these reforms and improve processes. So there's flexibility from the government's perspective. There's questions about competitive terms of international contracts. Are they economic? Are they providing the right incentives for foreign investors? Are the terms of contracts uh, correct? Uh, how is the price of oil going to affect these reforms and the initiative and, and the ability of foreign investors and even Mexican investors to get involved and, and, and partake in these uh, uh, opportunities? There's security issues. We've talked about the rule of law. Uh, how do we deal with corruption? Is there an effective judicial system? Will we have the right background and judges in our litigation and court system to be able to handle these huge international contracts? Um, is there open government? So that's just a few of the challenges. There are a lot of challenges. But we need to remember, Mexico energy reform is not constant. It's evolving. It just happened. It's continuing. There are going to be stumbles along the way. There's going to be challenges. Those challenges also create opportunities. And I, having grown up in Mexico, think that Mexico will find the right way and will find a path to make sure that this is a, a tremendous opportunity for everybody and a huge success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I want to uh, take a minute um, to reintroduce the Mexico Center here at the Baker Institute, uh, charged by uh, Ambassador to Region and Secretary Baker. I came to uh, the Baker Institute to create the Mexico Center, uh, certainly a place to think very hard about Mexico and to study Mexico very, very deeply. And I think uh, with these panels, uh, we're on our way. And I also want to thank, uh, of course, the staff at the Baker Institute behind an event like this. There's a lot of people from AV support to event support and, uh, and the design support, printing, and all kinds of people that work in the first and second floors of this building. Thank you, everyone. And of course, in the Mexico Center, uh, Lisa Waketa, who is right behind this, uh, our uh, Mexico Center uh, Co program coordinator, and uh, she was really behind that. And I want to thank especially our uh, partners, uh, the Mexico Forum, that support the center. And I want to thank our sponsor and, and supporter and friend, Haynes Gordon, especially George uh, Gonzalez and Hal Means uh, for uh, working with us to organize uh, this event and for supporting it, for underwriting it. And, and of course, uh, thank you all for coming to this uh, conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and it will be useful to you in the months to come. Thank you.